so many of you who did pray for Melanie, and I'm going to just uh, mention a little bit more in the in the in the message. Can we have our chapter slide up? I know it's Easter Sunday, and and I want this to be more like an application. So the message. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. All right. Our next door neighbour on, on one side, they always have two dogs. Always seem to want to have two dogs. And there'll be a succession of dogs coming and going. We have our, our next line. And what will happen is that when the, when the senior dog... Uh, goes for whatever reason, snakes, whatever. Some of you would have read, I had another snake in my study last night. <laughs> Mel, I'm pushing Mel into the study and we went, we went not running over it, we walked over it without seeing it and turned around. <laughs> and this, um, what are they called, white, white skull, white, white crown, white crown snake just sitting there and we thought, I think I'd better get away from here. Uh, unfortunately, in our house, it's the quick and the dead and I was quicker. <laughs> so, but our next door neighbour, they always have two dogs. They'll have a, uh, a dog, a senior dog, then after the, that senior dog goes, they usually get a puppy. And, and what happens is the a puppy might be a, a, a big breed, but because it's a puppy... The dog who was there before, which may be a small breed, but it's an adult dog. So the adult dog will intimidate the puppy. And then the puppy grows up into a big dog. And the dog who was there first is a small dog, but which one intimidates which one? The small one intimidates the big one. Because that's how it's thinking. That's how it was brought up. Is there a parallel? Aha. Uh -huh. Because the way you think will be the way you act. And if you have in your mind the thought that I'm small, that I'm ineffective, that I don't have in me the, the strength and the qualities that I need, you think like that, how will you act? You will act like that. When you talk with someone, they don't keep eye contact with you, their head is down. They're simply living out what's their person who is inside them. So I want to talk about it's not the size of the dog in the fight. And there's a passage. Now, let me just say, I don't question in any way the power of the devil, and I'll, I'll come back to, to this, but we have authority, and that's the difference. But we'll come on back to it. There's a passage in Ephesians that, that uh, perhaps through um, uh, the first month or so of this year, had a lot more impact on me. And uh, I just want to read from it. And I'm reading from uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. And in verse 17, Paul says, I keep asking. Now, he says, I keep asking, which means that he didn't just pray at once, but he went on praying this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? He said, so that you may know him better so you may know him better. So the ultimate goal is knowing God better. Now, we have this single English word, know. And um, now just say, John, can I use you as an example? Yes, you just blinked. Just say John comes up to you and says, you know Nathan Buckley? How many of you know Nathan Buckley? How many of you even know who Nathan Buckley is? One hand, two hands. All right. Picked a good example. My goodness, John. He's an AFL former great player. He's been a, a captain. He's now a commentator. But because it's AFL in Queensland, we know nothing about him. Do you understand that? <laughs> Except John. But if, if, if John came up and said, you know Nathan Buckley. I mean, if you said it to me, I'd say, oh, yeah, I know Nathan Buckley. Do I know Nathan Buckley? Do I know who Nathan Buckley is? Do you now know who Nathan Buckley is? <laughs> so, so we have one English word, no. But Paul had a whole raft of words he could choose. So when he says here about knowing God better, he chooses a word that means to discover, to experience through practical, personal knowledge of something or someone. 
it's, it's an ongoing practical uh, growth in, in knowing someone. It's not, not like, oh, yeah, I know Nathan Buckley. How many of you know Scott Morrison? Do I see a hand? <laughs> Put your hand down, Craig. See, but we know who he is, but we don't know him. And, and we're not, and Paul's using a word that means to know someone in an ongoing, very real way. In fact, it's a word that's related to the word for sight. So it means that we've been with them, we've seen them, we've experienced, we've, and it's a word that means to discover. It's an ongoing knowledge. All right, so, so when Paul is saying, I want you to know God better, we have our next slide. Oh, what a cute couple. This was um, a week, fortnight or so back, plus 35 years. All right, plus 35 years. And um, do you think Teresa knew me as well 35 years back that she knows me now? She asked me, she said, why is there a slide from our wedding day in this message? And I didn't tell her. And now she's come out to listen. There must be a God. She loves me after 35 years. And she knows me much better than she did back then. Much, much better. Because, you know, how many, I mean, when they say love is blind, there's a very real truth to that, isn't there? But you, you, you're with someone, you get to know them. It's this kind of knowledge. We go to our, our next slide. and our, our circumstances, difficult circumstances, often test how well we know God. Um, they really do. And I, I, it's been my, um, like, I think of all that we went through with Melanie. Teresa has known the Lord somewhere around 45 years, somewhere around there. She might, she'll come out later and say, no, no, not exactly, but somewhere around 45 years. I've known the Lord around 55 years, so I'm the, I'm the senior one who intimidates the... <laughs> but she was the puppy that grew up into the, into the big tree. <laughs> and now I think, oh, <laughs> I tell you what, I really, I really dislike having any kind of, I sit one way, she sees it the other way, and she's right. And it's happening more and more and more. All right, so... That was, yeah, two laughs. Thank you. That's very good. <laughs> but see, people who, it's been my, just, just watching, people who know God, people who know they're gone, I, I see when they go through a great test, they tend to come out better. Not always, but they tend to come out better. And I have watched too when uh, people who have a very shallow knowledge of God, even though they may have been Christians for a long, 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 long time, but the test often brings out stuff from that, that inner person that reveals to them and reveals to those around them too that they don't know God as deeply as they would really like to. So, so when Paul is praying for this church, he said, I want you to know God better. It's not just a, like a super spiritual thing. He knows what this church will go through. And so he knows that if they know God in a, a depth, in a most amazing depth, that they will come through all that is there all that is happening to them. I remember um, many, many years back in the early days of this, um, this church, and uh, the church had a very strong faith element. It was never, a, 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 never what we call a hyper-faith church, but a very strong faith element. And um, um, sometimes people would come into the church, they'd be attracted to that faith element, and then sometimes they would um, come to me and they would challenge me and say, Jeff, you know, you don't have enough faith. If you had more faith, you'd be believing for far greater things than you are right now. You know, it was my experience too many times, those same people, too many times, not always, too many times when they went through hard times, I saw them crash. I saw them crash. And I think, wait a minute, you're the one who challenging me that I don't have enough faith. And then I remember one time just sitting down with the concordance, I went through every New Testament scripture that used the word faith. And then I'm trying to work out, and I'm trying to put them into two categories. One category that talks about faith in, meaning faith in God, and then another category, those that talk about faith for, as in faith for healing. And then I found a third category with some where it could have gone either way. Now, I don't remember the numbers. I've got it written down somewhere, like everything in my study. 
But I found that it was something like, something like 150 odd scriptures talked about faith in God. From memory, there were five scriptures, four or five scriptures in the New Testament that talked about faith for something, and there were about three or four that were sort of in the, in the middle. So the emphasis of scripture is you having a faith in God. Now, I don't want to take away from the miraculous. I don't want to take away for faith for healing. I mean, obviously, Melanie's situation, how many times when the, uh, when the um, uh, specialist in ICU uh, talked to us about medical recommendations and, and said we're on the verge of a medical recommendation, meaning that, that we're coming to a point where we're, where we're saying we cannot do anything more medically and we're going to turn off what we're now doing. So they're just saying that's it. Now, we had from memory, it might come back to that. No, it was more. I remember four different times when specially came to us, sat us down, often with a social worker there, taking notes, wanting to make sure, do you fully understand what's going on? Now, that tested both faith for, but it really tested faith in. You understand that? So, so when Paul is praying, I really want the church to know God better. He knows that if they know him better, then that is going to uh, bring forth all other kinds of results for them. I'll just read uh, verse 18, uh, if I can find it. There it is. And he says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that, and then he's going to pray, he's gonna, there are three elements here. Uh, first one, that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Now, I want you to see each of these three relate to knowing God better. So the first one is the hope to which he has called you. The English word hope doesn't have much strength, does it? Hope it doesn't rain today. How certain is that? It has no certainty. The, word, the, the New Testament word is a very strong word. It's always future. It's always looking up ahead, and it's a confident expectation. It embraces heaven. It embraces all that God has for his children in a forward-looking way. So, so when, when Paul is uh, saying this, he's saying, I really want you to know the hope to which he's called you. He wants them to know about heaven. He wants them to know about all the amazing things from this point on. Second thing, he said there that you would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, the first Bible I had was so holy that I could not touch it. I was a young teenager, I was given a Bible, and it had stamped on the front of it, Holy Bible. And I, how do you say, I honoured the book more than I honoured the content. Because it would be years before I'd become a Christian. And then when I did become a Christian, then when I got a few things sorted out with God and, and was walking with God, and I wanted to mark my Bible, that Bible was too holy. So I went and bought a Bible that I could mark. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I tried to mark my phone, but it keeps, everything keeps moving. Uh, I, I put a color on something and then I, it's gone. Where's, where's the, see, you can't mark your phone, you can mark a book, can't you? And I would, I'd have my colored pencils and I had blue for all things heavenly, I had purple for the kingdom of God, I had, I had uh, all other colors, I had yellow for the Holy Spirit, I had... Uh, Green for prophet. I had all these things that I had lines down the side for this, and if I colored in, it meant that. See, I wanted to know what Christ had won for me here and now. See, the, the first thing Paul prays is future. This one, I want you to know the riches of his inheritance here and now. What's he done for you here and now? I, I have at home, I, I brought it down, a list of 25 things that Christ has done for me that I can claim, and there are uh, uh, oftentimes there are seasons where I have to confess these things and, and confess these things and I have the main scriptures underneath because I need to live in my inheritance here and now. This is my here and now life. It's living in the inheritance here and now. And then the third thing Paul prays, and this is what I'm, where, where we're going this morning, he prays that they would know his incomparably great power for us who believe. His incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, this will link where we are now to the future. So, the first one was hope, future. Second one, the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints here and now. This one looks forward. Now, he says if it's incomparably great, that means it's incomparably great. You can't compare it 
to any other thing. There is nothing I can compare to it. Let me just read to you from um, Ephesians chapter 1, 19 and 20. I'm reading from a different version that, that, that has a better flow to it. And, and it says this, I pray that you'll begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. It is that same power that raised Christ from the dead, seated him in the place of honour at God's right hand in heaven. Wow. The power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that touches us when we come to faith in Christ. The same power. And Paul has already said it is incomparable to any other power. So Paul is praying that Christians will, re will recognise the power of God is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. All right, our, our next slide. Paul was adamant Christ's death is the ultimate measure of the love of God. If, if someone said, oh, I don't, I don't believe God, God loves me, and we point to the cross, and sometimes someone who's not a Christian and, and it's just culturally out of their world, like we were down at Boone yesterday and there are Hare, Hare Krishnas going down the, down the footpaths. And I'm kind of looking at them thinking, man alive, this is so countercultural. And they're waving the, uh, almost explicitly um, Indian background. And I, I actually, I was a bit naughty. I turned up Keith Green really loudly. <laughs> and my favourite song is un, un, Until the Final Day. And I turned it up really loudly and I sang along. And if you've heard me sing really loudly, <laughs> oh my goodness. One time, Teresa was gardening and she could hear this this car coming down the street with the music screaming. And she, she's probably thinking, oh man, those teenagers. And then I pulled into our driveway. <laughs> and I didn't know she was out the front and I wanted to wait till the song ended. So I just went on singing. And when I turn it up really loud, they can't hear my voice. Probably the last time John will ever let me preach here, so I'm just going <laughs> to... So, Paul is adamant that Christ's death is the ultimate measure of the love of God. He's equally adamant that Christ's resurrection is the ultimate measure of the power of God. There's no greater power than the power that raised Christ from the dead. The power of God has no equal. But then, Paul will turn this around and say... The power in us is the power of the risen Christ. Because when you go to Romans 6, he's not saying, oh, you know, you yield to, uh, well, kind of the life of Christ. No, he talks about you yield to the resurrection life of Christ. Because the life in us when we came to faith in Christ was the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus. It was not just, if I, if I, I want to be careful what I say, it's not just, generally the life of Christ or generally the Holy Spirit. It was the resurrection life of Christ that indwelt your spirit the moment you put faith in, in Christ. And that's a, an amazing thing. And, and Paul had that so very, very clear. Let me, um, would you read with me? And we'll put it up, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Well-known scripture, known to, to uh, anyone who's been in church life for any length of time. I want to pick up on just two words, eternal life. And, and this term will be used mainly by John in John's gospel. And this term meant something to those who heard it that we don't hear the same way today. And, and um, uh, the reason for that is, and you can Google this. How many know Google is a terrible theologian but, but Google does have some good stuff in there. Often, um, Emma will, will uh, from America, my daughter Emma will say, Dad, quick, I've got two hours. I'm doing a message on such and such. Tell me about this one or that one. And the other day, quick, um, and then she said, I've got one hour. Tell me all about Jairus' tribe. You know, the guy who's pitched the thing through the king's head. You know, tell me all about his tribe. And I said, I just wrote that. I'll have to look it up. She said, don't you know? No, I do now. He was a Midianite. <laughs> Did you know that? Who told me that? Mr. Google told me that. All right. But this word eternal life, literally, two words. One word means life. 
The other word means the age, the life of the age, the life of the age. So when in Jesus' day, when fellow Jews heard the term eternal life, what did they hear? They heard that if someone put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, they would receive the life of the age. What's this? They believed then, and Jesus said this was right, there are two ages. And, and he will, I'll show you the scripture from Matthew 12 in a moment. He said there's this age and the age to come. Two great ages that they understood. Uh, Matthew 12, 32, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. So two great ages that they understood. So when the term eternal life is used, it is literally the life of the age, not of this age. They understood it to be the life of the age to come. So they understood that Jesus was promising them if they put their faith in him, they would receive the life of the age to come. What did they understand about the age to come? Very similar to what we understand after Christ comes back. That there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust, the, or the righteous and, uh, and the un, unrighteous. Terrible term, but anyway, there will be a, a resurrection of all people. There will be a great judgment and the righteous will live with their God on a renewed earth. That was the Jewish understanding, and that's virtually our own understanding too. And that was the age to come. That's what they understood would happen then. So, so what happens is that when you and I come to faith in Christ, we receive in our, in our innermost being, in our spirit, the life of the age to come. So this was revolutionary, revolutionary. All right, so um, I've gone right ahead of what I was going to say. So someone will say, well, wait there, if we have the, the life of the age to come right now, why can't we do what Jesus did? He could walk through walls. How many have tried to walk through walls recently? How many tried to walk through where there's a door, but the door was shut accidentally? All right. Why can't we do that? But Jesus could in his resurrection because he had... A resurrection body. How many have a resurrection body? I see that hand. I think it shouldn't be up. All right. I've ordered muscles on my resurrection body because I didn't figure I got enough on this one. When I was a kid, I was so skinny. I had two bullies from our year. One time, cut come up to me. I thought, I'm going to get a bloody nose out of, oh, sorry, bloodied nose out of this. I'm not allowed to say the other word in church. And these guys came, came up to me and they put, they just went like that and they put their fingers around my wrist. And, and it's like their fingers overlapped. And they said, man, you've got the blankety blank blank skinniest wrists I've ever seen. And I just stood there or sat there, wherever I'm doing, petrified. I'm going to get smacked. I'm going to get hit. And then they walked away. I've never been so glad to be so skinny. <laughs> but on my resurrection body, I've asked for more than I got on this one. All right. Oh, look, John, he's got a perfect body, works out and does all this stuff. And he said, no, God, I'm very happy with, with this one. <laughs> all right, so, so then let me just read from Ephesians chapter 1 and um, from verse 19. Paul, Paul wrote this, I also pray that you will, un now this I'm coming back now to a different version of the same verse, that you will understand the incredibly, the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. Now he says this, this is the same power, and then verse 20, that raised Christ from the dead, seated him in the place of honour at God's right hand in the heavenly realm, far above rulers or authorities or power or leader or anything else. This sounds like living Bible. Um, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And has put all things under the authority of Christ and made him head over all things for the benefit of his church. So, I'm not sure what slide what we're up to. I think, yeah, I think that one's right. So the resurrection power not only lifted Christ from death, but the same power seated him at God's right hand, the place of ultimate authority. Now, just a few verses later, Paul writes this uh, in, a, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, verses 5 and 6. But because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, 
made us alive with Christ, and even when we were dead in transgression, by grace you have been saved. Now listen to this. God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. So Paul is saying that, that when Christ was raised from the dead, he was raised to a place of glorious authority. But then Paul goes on to say, and the same thing happened to you. When you put your faith in Christ and the Spirit of God, the life of Christ, the risen life of Christ came to indwell your spirit, he raised you up to that place of authority, the same place of authority that he gave to his son, to the Lord Jesus. So I'm looking at this and he's saying, well, the resurrection life of Christ raised him. The resurrection life of Christ has raised me. Now, does that mean that I can, I can do all this and I can walk on water? Anyone tried to walk on water recently? I can command the waves and they will stop. I've actually seen that happen. I didn't do it, but in Newcastle there was a water baptism, an area called the Blowhole. Massive waves come in. A friend back then called John, John Lovell put up his hand and said, and I don't know what he just yelled out because we are just looking at the big waves and he just commanded that the waves stop and the waves just stopped. They just dropped down. They baptised those who were going to be baptised and as they walked away, what happened to the waves? They all came back up. All right, we will have little glimpses of that, but until that time that we have the resurrection bodies, we won't see the, the most extraordinary things that the Lord Jesus saw in his resurrection body. All right, so, so Paul is praying for the Ephesian church, and he wants the Ephesian church to know these amazing things. Why does this church need to know it? What was the, which was the church that when Paul preached, there was such a move of God that all those involved with witchcraft brought all their witchcraft paraphernalia to be burned. Hint, same church, hint. Anyone want to call it out? Oh, yes. Was that you, John? Oh, no wonder you're the pastor. <laughs> same church. And see, when there's a breakthrough against the whole demonic world, how do you think the demons feel? Do you think they say, oh, well, we'll give this one over to Paul? Or do you think they will counter? I think they will, they, they will counter. The devil doesn't have authority, but he does have power. And so there is a, 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 a resurgence of demonic stuff coming against the church in Ephesus. And so Paul is praying, you guys need to know not only that you have the life of Christ, you need to know you have the resurrected life of Christ. You need to know that you have been raised to a place of authority. The devil has power, but you have authority. You need to know that. You need to know that. This church needed to know that. For the first two and a half years of my Christian life, I was a Clark Kent Christian. How many know who Clark Kent is? How many know who Clark Kent is? Uh, like almost like a queen wave, like my hand is so tired from waving to thousands of people. You know. All right. What did Clark Kent in the old days have to do before he could become Superman? He had to. He had to find a phone booth. How many of you said you know who Clark Kent is? Why? He had to find a phone booth. So for two and a half years, I was a Clark Kent Christian looking for a phone booth. I couldn't find one. I was a wimp for Jesus. And I hardly read the Bible. I hardly prayed. And if, if, um, if there's any kind of spiritual conversation, I just backed right away. I wouldn't know what to, to say. And it's like I, I, was, just, I was just a wimp. I, I, there was no great... My, my wife said, you're out of the, out of the camera. There was just no strength that I could, felt that I could get hold of. Now, what happened? Did it mean that I didn't have the resurrected power of Christ within? What was the problem? I didn't know that I had the power of Christ within. Remember that verse in, in um, Isaiah, I think? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Not lack of power, although that, that is in there too, but for lack of knowledge, lack of knowledge. So let me just bring this now to a, to a close. So when the devil comes at you and just says, you are so weak, you're so weak, you know, you're never going to rise up, you're never going to do anything for Christ. 
how do you respond? Do you put your head down or don't have any eye contact or, or, do, or does something inside you rise up and say, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world? Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Do I have that strength in myself? No, I don't. But I have that strength in Christ. So when the devil is coming in and he's, and he's, he's trying to intimidate you, he's trying to be like that little dog. He's barking at you. He's growling at you. He's snarling at you. But you're the big dog. You really are the big dog. But it's what is inside your mind. So when he comes to you and the devil says, you'll never break free of that area of weakness. You're always going to have sin. You're always going to have, you know, whatever that area is. It may be a sexual area. It may be an area of gambling. It can be, you know, one of multitude, gossip, a whole lot of different stuff. And something has to rise on the inside and say, and, and recognizing we're not pretending that that thing hasn't been there, but we are saying, I have an overcoming nature on the inside. You know, in John, first John chapter 3 and um, first part of verse 6, where, where, where uh, John is saying, look, um, um, because of who we are, we don't sin. And we used to, I used to read that and think, I feel like rubbing that out of my Bible because that wasn't true of me. But if I yield to that nature, that nature in me, that, that resurrected life of Christ, that life can't sin. That life can't, can't sin. My flesh can sin. So who am I yielding to? If I yield to that life, the resurrected life of Christ, I won't sin. And so there's a choice on my part. When the devil comes in and tells me, I have no authority to pray for the sick. You know, you can't pray for the sick. Who do you think you are? You think you're Pastor John? <laughs> I'm just guaranteeing I never get asked back again. <laughs> but something inside has to rise up and say, when I lay hands on the sick, it, they might be my hands, but it's the life of Christ in me that is being released. The life of Christ in me. I think when the Lord Jesus would say, and, and he'd have people around and said, who touched me? Because, and then and there's a scripture, well, there, there are two in Luke. In, in, in one he said, for power has left me. So like the, 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 um, the, 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 the power of the Spirit of God over him, the anointing of the Spirit, but when people even touched him, healing flow. And I remember in really, really early days, and I was talking with um, a visitor this morning, was it Len? When we were talking earlier, was that your name, Len? And just talking about Clark, Clark Taylor. And Clark Taylor was the first person who I heard who taught that when you pray for the sick, you release the power of God from within. And he said, you're not praying that it comes down, you're releasing the power of God from within. In the early days of, of, of this church, when we saw so many amazing healings, and even though there was a certain amount of, a lot of praying beforehand, when we prayed for the sick, there was a releasing of the power of God within. So when you pray for the sick, and, and, and I don't want to take away from praying that God will come down and do that work, but I also don't want to take away from the emphasis that if you're a Christian, and, the spirit, and so the Spirit of God lives in you. When you lay hands on the sick, you can release the power of God. This is not some kind of humanism or sorry, some kind of uh, a weird New Agey stuff. This is, this is Bible. This is New, New Testament. And the last one, when the devil comes at you and says, your prayer is in the... What, you, you think you're going to pray and do some good? You think your prayer gets beyond the ceiling? Two things. One... Devil, if you think my prayer is so ineffective, why do you stop me praying? I've often said that. I, I, I don't know how many times, how rarely over all the years God has ever stopped me preaching through sickness or whatever. Hardly ever, year after year after year. But, but he tries to stop me praying in, in just infinitely more times than he would stop, try to stop me preaching. So when the devil comes and, and, and he has said to me, Jed, you've been praying for that for years. You haven't seen it happen. And I'm learning to, to come back and say, then why do you try to stop me praying? He stopped me praying because that's where the power is. And the, and the second thing is that I, I know when I'm, I'm praying, I'm, uh, I'm telling him, I've got to tell the devil, I have been raised with the Lord Jesus. His resurrected life is inside of me. I'm seated with him in heavenly places. 
I can come before the Heavenly Father. I can bring what I'm praying before Him. I have the life of Christ on the inside. He brings me in fully into the very presence of the Heavenly Father to bring my petition, to bring my prayer to, to Him. So when the devil growls at you like a little dog, what are you going to do? That's not a hippo, that's a rhino. What sort of dog is that? It looks like a little chihuahua. Who's chasing who? Come on, one of us will chase a thousand. Two of us will chase ten thousand. See, if we know on the inside the life of Christ is in there, and we have the resurrected life of Christ in there. So on this day, this resurrection day, this day when we um, celebrate that the Lord Jesus has been raised from the dead, and I, I realized I haven't talked so much about him directly and what he did, but I want you to know that the, the impact and what Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, a, a, a church that would be um, surrounded and attacked by demonic powers. He wanted them to know the power of Christ on the inside. He wanted them to know the devil might have power, but you, church, you have authority. And if you take hold of that, something will rise up. Something will rise up. Will the devil test it? You bet he will. Will he test it in my life? You bet he will. In fact, I'm saying, God, am I ready for this? He's very quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> but this is Bible. This is the life of Christ. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to hand over to Wendy. We're just going to close with that song and then hand back to, to John. Lord Jesus, when you die, we as believers in you, our old life died in you. When you were raised from the dead, you imparted to us, into our spirit, your resurrected life. Romans 6 talks over and over about yielding to the resurrected life of Christ. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. You would come and you would reveal to us who we are in him, and the amazing work that he's done. And on the inside, something would rise up perhaps more than it has for a very long time, we would take hold of Christ. Do that good work, Anna. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.